What does the 12 tribes movement believe? This is People of the Free Gift, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. If you're new to the channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button because we post content related to the cults and how to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ several times a week. And so let's go ahead and jump right in. The 12 Tribes, my first experience with this group, which happens to be my only experience with them. I was at Harvest Crusade in Anaheim, California, and I had taken my youth group there. And after the event, we are trying to leave the stadium. It's kind of a mad rush, trying to get back to our car. There are several groups that are out there, and they're trying to kind of prey upon, uh, you know, unwilling, unwitting um people who had just maybe accepted Christ or were in a position where they were seeking or younger believers or just younger in age. And one of those groups was the 12 tribes. I had never heard of the group before then. And they handed me and some of the other members of my group uh, a pamphlet, a magazine. And in that, it made it very clear that their gist of their movement and what they were asking me personally and anybody who they could uh, to is that we are supposed to sell everything we have and move to one of 12 locations around the world. The closest to us would be Miami, Florida. You can go on their website and find out exactly where the nearest location to you is. And you're supposed to give all the money to that group and you're supposed to live amongst that group and you're supposed to live for the common good. And so it's a common purse. And then uh, they were pointing to verses like the call of Abraham and uh, Genesis 12. So if you're one of our Bible study, study through the Bible students, that's really relevant to what we're going through right now in the life of Abram. And his call to go, leave your family and go to the land I'll show you. Uh, they use the rich young ruler in the conversation with Jesus, where Jesus uh, tells him that you're supposed to sell all you have and follow me. And they would point to Acts chapter 2 and following, where uh, you have the early believers having everything in common, and they supply to everyone as they have need. And they would take verses like those and show them to be the general call. That That is what God has and always has been calling his people to do, and that uh, was that was the gist of it. And so I didn't obviously take it very seriously, but I did a little bit more research on it. And uh, I'm going to talk later about how they've made some drastic changes to their website um, that I, I think are really unfortunate and misleading. And so what do they believe? Well, uh, in an overall general sense, I would say this is definitely one of those groups that it's not so much their doctrine as much as their practice. And that's generally true for all the groups that I discuss, that it, while I talk about their doctrine and they generally have doctrines that deviate from core Christian doctrine, it's really the abusive practices and obviously, you know, asking somebody to completely rid themselves of all their identity, to, to move their physical location, to sell everything that they have, rid themselves of all, you know, strips of their own personhood and, uh, you know, possessions and to come into this community uh, is definitely, uh, you might be a cult, right? I mean, so... What do they believe? They believe that Jesus paid for our sin over the course of three days and three nights as he was suffering in hell. So not on the cross, it wasn't finished on the cross, that Jesus from the cross actually goes into hell. He's suffering uh, in torment and he's paying for our sins over those three days and three nights. And then uh, he cries out to the Father. The Father hears him and grants his request. He returns his soul and his body uh, and his spirit to his body, and he rose from the dead. So very, very different because that's not even so much a resurrection as it is a resuscitation, just like he did with Lazarus uh, and other things. And the whole idea of him going to hell, Jesus actually suffering in hell, uh, and then that is the way that he paid for our sins. But ultimately, we're going to find that Jesus is really irrelevant here. Uh, and what he did on the cross or in hell uh, is really irrelevant to anything re related to this group, really. 
They believe that Jesus will return when his people are perfect and become like him, and they teach this is done through living life for others in the community of believers, particularly their community. So this is kind of a weird spin because it's kind of a mixture between dispensationalism, which tends to believe that the Bible says that the world's going to become worse and worse, leading up to the return of Christ, that like the church might grow, but the worst is going to be the world's going to become worse and worse. But then it's also postmillennialism and that, you know, like the church is called to reach a certain state before Jesus is going to be able to come back and set up his reign. So like we basically establish it for him, something for him to come back and to set up his reign in. And so it's kind of a mixture, a weird blend between those two because they believe that their community is, needs to become completely pure. And then that when that, those hap, that happens with those 12 communities, then Jesus will come back and set up his kingdom. But meanwhile, the world is just going to hell in a handbasket, right? You know, so interesting little blend there. So when somebody hears the gospel from a worthy member of the community, they're given faith. And that faith allows them to obey. And obedience means selling all they have and move into the community with them, where they share a common life and common purse. And so you have this uh, interesting twist on salvation by grace through faith. It's kind of that same idea of grace being divine empowerment. So God empowers you to do what you need to do to be saved, which is not very far off. I, you know, in a sense, I, I, we believe that faith is a gift of God, repentance is granted by God, and nobody comes to God except if he's drawn by the, the Spirit. But at the same time, I, what, how they define it is definitely a work. You, you can't really separate that out. That, you know, you are physically doing a whole lot of stuff, rearranging your entire life, and your location and everything else around this teaching and so there's really no way to separate this out this is salvation by works very clearly even though they're masking it in a language of salvation by grace through faith and they teach that the body of Christ is organizing the 12 distinct regions throughout the world and each one of those represents the tribe of Israel so you know, where in the Old Testament you have, like, literally within the land of Israel, you have the 12 tribes separated out. They would say, like, no, that's now the whole world, and it's divided up into 12 strategic locations, and that's where they place their communities, and that's where they, that, that's how they believe it's supposed to be done. There are three distinct categories of people going to three distinct destinations in eternity. So it's the unjust and filthy, and those are those who live uh, by, they don't even live according to their own conscience, right? So they kind of just, you know, do what they please and uh, don't really care and listen to anybody. No law, no conscience, no religion, nothing, right? And so uh, also those who are going to hell are those who have heard the gospel from a worthy member of their community and they have rejected it. And so I'd be curious if they consider taking a magazine from them, reading it, knowing what it said, understanding what it said, is rejecting the gospel, because in, in that case, I would be going to hell. But I'd be unjust and filthy, which I, I would completely agree with that from a biblical standpoint. I, I deserve hell. If it was by my own merits. That's exactly where I'd be going, and I have no qualms about that. Uh, the righteous is the second category, and they are those who would never heard, had the opportunity to hear the gospel, but they live according to their conscience. Now, interesting, I, I don't even know exactly what they would mean by that because everybody has those things that they know that inside is telling you, something's telling you don't do that and you still do it. Everybody does that. And that, that the Bible calls it sin. They're calling it going against your own conscience. And so um, who would exactly would be in that category? Those who have lived according to their conscience. It's kind of interesting. So they teach something interesting here. They're worthy of the second death, but their first death pays for their sins. So again, you know, Jesus didn't pay for their sins. They pay for their sins by physically dying. It's kind of like they're bringing back that idea in the Old Testament that there were certain sins, like murder, that that individual needed 
to uh, die, you know, and that was the only way to cleanse the, the land kind of thing. And so, you know, the Mormons have the blood atonement thing in their history. It's kind of that same concept, you know, like there's certain sins that you can only uh, atone for. And yet they would say, like, all of your sins, you know, you are worthy of the second death, but you're you dying pays for your sins. And so, again, I, I don't know exactly where Jesus plays in for these people. And so they are destined, uh, the people in this group, the righteous, are destined to serve the holy. So they're going to go to heaven, but they're going to be servants. And then you got the holy, and the, the heart, they hear the gospel and respond to it by selling everything they have and joining the community with the 12 tribes. They are baptized and cry out to the name of the Lord to save them. They live for God and not themselves, and they're going to rule with Jesus Christ in heaven and the righteous. And so, and um, a lot of, you, you can see a lot of overlap with biblical teaching, but a twisting, uh, so to speak. And that's kind of true of all these groups. They have their own little twist and terminology differences uh, that make them distinct and put them really outside of core Christian doctrine. Um, but their distinctives, this was kind of interesting. Even though they're told to live in these communities and don't participate in the world, they live in the world, they have bakeries, delis, stores, farms, hotels, in the world to make money off of the world. And, you know, that's true for, like, the Amish. That's true uh, for even, like, the compound, you know, the fundamentalist LDS people. You know, they, they refer to it as bleeding the beast. Kind of interesting little thing about uh, the, these people. And, you know, they have the, the, the men wearing beards and have their hair back. Women have distinct clothing. And they don't participate in electronics, which is kind of standard. If you're going to live in a compound, you know, we don't want to pay for Wi-Fi and you know, electric bills. So no electronics, right? Um, and so I, I wanted to talk just briefly at the end of this about the changes to the website. When I initially did my research, I went straight to the source. And that's really, there's not a whole lot of people talking about this group. And so I went straight to the source, their website, same website as it is today, 12tribes.org, I believe. And they had a clear section, you know, what do we believe? And they still, it took me forever when I went back uh, recently to kind of go back and, you know, look at some of this stuff. I, it took me forever to find that article. I had to find it through Google. I couldn't even find it through the website. But that article had completely changed. Before, they were just completely transparent with everything I just said. But now, they have this whole defense of, like, we are not a cult. We are not a cult. Which, that's a bad sign if you have to dedicate so much attention to that question about you being a cult. But then, they said everything that I just said, but they said it in just shrouded language. And and terminology that if you did not know what was underneath that, you would have no idea this is what they're saying. But this is, if they still believe the same things, they're just phrasing it differently, which is another scary step in the direction of a cult. Uh, in my, my book, in my estimation, that's exactly what they're doing. And so I want to know what you all you think. What's your experience with this group? Have you ever heard of this group? Is there something that I, I didn't mention that you want to share with the rest of us? Is there a question you have about this group? I would love to talk to you more. Uh, maybe if you're in this group and you're watching this somehow, even though you don't watch electronics, you know, know that we love you. We, we want to reach out to you. I'd love to talk to you. And so um, feel free to, to put that in the comments down below. So like I said, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, give us a thumbs up on this video. Share this uh, with other people who are trying to reach out to those caught in religion with the gospel. This all came uh, through my book, Sharing Jesus with the Cults, and the, the tiny little chapter I have on this, of this group. And so um, you can purchase that on Amazon through paperback or Kindle. And uh, so until next time, may God's grace be with you.